Yay! <laughs> thank you. So thank you all for coming. Um, I am a little out of practice at this. It's been a couple years since I've given a talk in person. So just be patient with me if I forget my words. I just was making up words at breakfast this morning. So we're off to a great start. Um, <laughs> so um, I want to start off by introducing myself. My name is Jillian. I've worked in AppSec for 13 years, and over that course of that time, learned about 20 different programming languages. And I love teaching, which is why I'm here, and it's why I started my company. I do teaching full time, almost sort of <laughs> working on it. Um, but I also wanted to get to know you guys a little bit since we have some time. Um, how many of you uh, work in application security? Just by a show of hands. Yay! Most people, okay. And then uh, network security, anybody network? Okay, you do both? Okay. <laughs> um, other sorts of security or you just are hoping to get into it? I guess that's two different questions, but yay. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, well, thank you all for coming. And uh, this, to be perfectly honest, was designed to be a half an hour talk, but I will open it up to questions at the end. And we'll, we'll use the time. I would just <laughs> make it useful. So the whole point of this talk is to make your job easier uh, and hopefully help you be more successful at your job. So for the many of you who also work in AppSec, um, it's, it's tough. It's a tough job. And you're expected to do way more than you can fit into a normal week. And everybody is, it, it's one of those jobs where nobody notices if you're doing things right and everybody notices if you mess up and it's it's just a really tough job i have been doing it for a long time myself and i have just thank you for sticking it out and being here and hopefully i'm going to give you some ideas that will help make it easier today so that's, that's the whole point of my talk um so here's the big what if now what if you can get other people to do your job for you and they were actually happy to do it so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, you guys are so quiet. <laughs> oh, good. I got a, okay, got a giggle. Um, now, a couple of quotes for you. Uh, Bruce Schneier says, amateurs hack systems, professionals hack people. So what we're going to be talking about today is using social engineering skills for good. And, and for socially engineering people to, to do your job for you. Um, and another quote, just something to think about. I have yet to find the person who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than he would ever do under a spirit or criticism. That also includes she's and days. Just, just so you know. It's just that's how the quote came out. I didn't want to edit it. Um, but I have found in my professional career that people are more willing to help if it's in a spirit of co-creation. And they're... They, they have something invested in it. So if somebody is helping you with security rather than security coming to their desk and saying, why did you do this? And did you fix that vulnerability? Um, it's just, it's gonna go a lot easier for you. So building rapport. Now, uh, I wanna talk a minute about external bug bounties after I drink some water. Now, how many of you have an external bug bounty program now? couple cool um so you can probably talk about the the problems with those and the, that they bring and it does solve some things uh but i have found that they create a lot of noise um filtering out quality bug reports versus not so good bug reports uh, that takes a lot of time and effort and energy and you already have too much to do so that's, that's one thing um, it can be very expensive if you're not ready for it. So if you're paying people for bugs. And it can lead to a sense of overwhelm, which I, I think, as discussed previously, we're all already feeling anyway. So um, those are the problems that we're going to try to solve with an internal bug bounty. Um, so as contrasted to an external bug bounty, you can certainly do both, uh, whatever position you're in. Uh, but just I personally would recommend starting internally and let that be a good practice for an external bug bounty. So. 
Now, this is a fun subject, uh, getting commitment. Now, obviously, I want you all to be very successful in your in internal bug bounty and all of your security endeavors. Like, you, you want you to be successful. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this and how, like, we already know it's important that executives buy into uh, your security, whatever you're doing. Um, and that's just part of it. But it's also important to get them to talk about it. So if they've signed off on paper, that doesn't get you as much rapport as, like, if people are seeing the executives talk about security. So the trick here is to socially engineer your executives into talking about security. Um, so how do you do that? Or, or sorry, I had an FAQ first. I forgot about that. Um, so what if your executives don't think security is important now? Um, and my honest answer is find a new job. Um, <laughs> but that's not a realistic answer. So the best thing that you can do is try to be a good salesperson for security. And I find that executives tend to care about whatever's in the newspaper. I don't know why, uh, but whatever headline of the day is, if you can find a way that, to make that applicable to your job and what you're doing and what you're trying to do, that gets their attention. Because I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think it's because executives don't want to see their company in the newspaper. And maybe that's why they care. And I guess paper, newspapers aren't really even a thing anymore. Does anybody get a paper? It's all online. But you know, the, in the news. <laughs> You know what I mean. Okay. Um, I, I have some more tricks for talking to executives later on if you want. Um, but uh, here's just a few things to consider. Um, that slide might, might be worth taking some notes on. Uh, but first of all, you want to remember that they're busy. So whenever you go to an executive, I personally try to fit whatever I have to say into a 15 minute meeting or less. And that's hard to do when you're talking about complicated things. Uh, but practice and try to distill it down to 15 minutes. Uh, speak from their perspective why they think it, why they should think that it's important. Um, I know that I personally, I don't know about you, but I tend to get very wrapped up in what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about. And when I go and talk to somebody else, I have to remember that they don't care about all of these technical details. They want to know how does this affect me. So uh, just a tip there. Uh, watch the nonverbal communication. Now, this is something that I have personally spent a great deal of time studying, which sounds weird. Um, I recently learned that I'm autistic, and uh, this it suddenly everything made sense. I'm like, oh, this is why I have spent a lifetime reading books about how people behave, <laughs> and um, so I I have you know some tips there. But for nonverbal communication. Uh, things like if they're leaning forward like this, they're interested, arms crossed, they're defensive, um, stuff like that. And a little, little hack for you, uh, not a hack, but um, if you mirror what they're doing with their body language, it's a subconscious signal that we're on the same page. Just something to try, but don't be too obvious about it. Like if they scratch their nose and then you scratch your nose and like, don't make it obvious. You want to be subtle, but um, things like this is useful for dating too, if you're still dating, but when they take a drink, you take a drink. It's a way of building rapport subconsciously and they won't even know it, but don't use that for evil. Just <laughs> use it for good. Um, another thing is uh, sticking to the facts. So uh, personally, uh, just when, when you go and talk to the executives, you want to stick to what happened and why and how do we fix it, not who did what. I would very much avoid blaming people because that gets you into a big mess and political stuff at your company. You don't want to do that. Um, hold on, more water. <clears throat> um, these last two. Uh, have a solution for every problem and have an answer for every question. And executives tend to ask questions like, how much is this going to cost me? And how long is it going to take? You should at least know the answers to that ahead of time. And if you can do these things, you will be very successful in talking to the important people at your company and the important people in your life too. It works for non-security non things. <laughs> so, yay. 
So once you've gotten commitment from your executives and they've bought in and they've told the whole company, hey, security is really important, we're going to do this really cool thing. It's an internal bug bounty. So once check mark, um, you still have a little bit of prep work to do in order for the bug bounty to be successful. Um, organizing vulnerabilities, which is as much fun as it sounds like. Um, how, just show of hands if you care to admit, um, but how many of you have all of the list of vulnerabilities in the same place? Yay, I'm glad you're here. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I didn't either for a long time because it's a lot of work to organize all of your vulnerability data in the same place. But it will make your life easier in the long run. I promise it's worth the effort. Um, so what, what I would suggest, oh, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself because this is in the FAQs. Um, forget I said that. It's a surprise. Um, <laughs> so uh, is it organized and can you easily report on vulnerability data? These are questions uh, that you already answered the first one. So number two, probably no, that's okay. And um, easily reporting comes in handy for those people we talked about in, in the first step of those executives. They like reports, they like numbers, they like colors, they like pie charts. You want that sort of stuff for them. So you can show them that you've been successful and then you can keep your job. It's always good. <laughs> um, so FAQs, where should vulnerability data be centralized? And my suggestion to that would be wherever your engineers are already looking at for stuff to do. So ticketing system, perhaps. Um, and I would recommend your ticketing system just because you want them to actually fix the vulnerabilities, right? So if it's all in a spreadsheet somewhere, it's not as visible and not as actionable. That would be my recommendation. And um, the scripting comes in handy for this. So if you take your tool data, your scan data, write a script to automatically feed it into JIRA or wherever. I don't know if I'm supposed to do product placement. Um, <laughs> but um, try to automate that as much as possible. And again, it's a lot of work up front, but it makes your life so much easier. Um, number two, uh, does this mean the security team will be spending all their time creating tickets? I say no, make somebody else do that. Get an intern. Uh, <laughs> or uh, even better, when we get to it, the bug bounty. You're going to encourage your engineers to write security tickets and give them fun, fabulous prizes. So, so that's step number five. And I'm, I'm talking way too fast. <laughs> I've only been talking for 10 minutes. Um, OK, so next up, uh, prioritization. This is another important step in order for you to be successful. Um, and we still haven't even gotten to the fun part. I promise it's coming. Hang in there. Um, but you want to create some sort of an object objective standard um, <laughs> for prioritizing vulnerabilities. Um, so high, medium, critical, low, whatever. Um, now this has been done for you. I use CVSS to score vulnerabilities and you want something that is objective. So it, you get rid of the arguments about how important something is, you know? Um, so this is my recommendation and will make your life easier. Um, training people how to use it might be a totally different thing, but it's, We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> now, you also want to create some sort of service level agreement. Um, so critical, this is my recommendation of what, what I would do in, in an organization. But critical should be fixed like top priority ASAP. And that's a true critical, a 10 on the CVSS system. Um, so high 7 to 30 days, medium 60, 30 to 60, etc. Now, getting agreement for that is going to depend on, you know, your influence and the speech, whatever speech the executives gave at the beginning of this, saying, hey, security is important. Um, so this is where it comes into backing that up with action. So if you can go to your engineering teams and say, hey, I'd really like you to agree to this, you're going to have to haggle. Uh, so you might want to go in with, with something better than this and then settle on something medium. Um, but if you can get them to agree to that and get it in writing or, or a recorded Zoom meeting or whatever, but get, get proof that they agreed to it, trust me, um, 
then that's going to make your life easier. So a uh, common problem is having a huge backlog of security issues. Now, how do you get to the service level agreement when devs are still working on security issues that you found six months ago? Um, that is an excellent question. And hold on, I need more water. I'm so thirsty today. I'm just... Huh. <clears throat> okay. So... Uh, my recommendation would be to just get them to agree to spend like 20% of a sprint on security issues until they get caught up. So you say, these are the SLAs now, um, then, when, then we'll get to that and just agree to it now, we'll work on it. 20% of our tickets are going towards security issues and that's, yeah, that's a good compromise. But Common problem for sure. Now. We're getting to the bug bounty part. <laughs> Yay! That's what you're all here for. Um, all of those first steps are completely necessary. Otherwise, it's just going to be a disaster. But bless you. Um, How do you say it in Norwegian? Bless you. Sorry? I'm going to mess that up. <laughs> Pro sit? Ah, okay. Tusen talk. That's, that's literally, that's all I know. I really tried. <laughs> okay. So next up is training. Um, you, you want people to know what they're looking for, right? So that would be your next step is to teach them what they're looking for. Uh, you can make it fun. Um, that's first recommendation is to make it fun. Um, yeah, only a rare few individuals actually enjoy being in a classroom for days at a time. So I would also recommend kind of breaking it up and not sit them for hours at a time and try to teach them about security issues. Uh, one recommendation would be just to do like a weekly lunch and learn kind of thing, like buy them food. Pizza is always a big hit, um, but spend like an hour every Friday or something teaching them about, okay, here's what cross-site scripting looks like and here's SQL injection. Uh, you're gonna, you won't lose as much goodwill doing it that way. If you're buying them food, teaching them a little bit, rather than sitting them in a classroom for eight hours at a time. But, yep. Uh, oh, uh, the fire hose approach. You want to avoid that. That may be an American saying. Um, I, I do apologize. But you don't want to just blast them with a whole bunch of information. Because you want them to actually retain the information, too. So, okay. Um, oh! I have a note here about patching, so you don't want to forget about that. I focus a lot on the developers because that's who I'm used to working with, uh, but same with the people that are responsible for maintaining things. Uh, you want to bring them into the bug bounty too because an out-of-date operating system counts and you can get a prize for finding that. So, um, All right, fabulous prizes. This is where the fun comes in. Okay. <laughs> um, you want to create some initiatives to get people to work for you, right? So, um, let's see. It's the way I've done this in the past is like almost like a competition. So you can break it down to individual people or to teams. Like if you have multiple product teams, you can pit them against each other to see who finds the most vulnerabilities. That always goes over well. And then give a prize to whoever finds the most. And you want them to fix them too, but you can do that as a separate prize. Um, now, for your people. So, uh, yes, make it fun for people to come to you. That's that's the general idea here. Um, this does You can make it very budget friendly though. You could have um, donuts for the people who, who win the most, or win the most, who find the most vulnerabilities. And, um, just any sort of simple recognition is great. Like you can get them a trophy or a medal, but like a really big obnoxious trophy that travels around to the desk of the person who's in first place, that can be fun. Although I don't know if you're back in the office or not. So it doesn't work so well if you're working at home. Um, but anyway, it's just another idea. Um, if your executives really think security is important, you can go big. You could do like free trips or a steak dinner. Um, just whatever, but yeah. Now, here's a common question I've gotten. How do you keep people from writing security bugs just to get credit for finding them? 
and it, it's a very good question. Um, <laughs> one thing that I would recommend is just make that part of the rules up front is that you can't find your own bugs. Like you have to find it in an, somebody else's code. Um, um, I have a small gift for you. I've written this and even more detailed ideas in an ebook. Um, if you don't trust QR codes, which you shouldn't really, but I can also put the link in Slack and, and you can do that, but um, cool. So I really out of practice. Thank you guys for sticking with me. Does anybody have any questions? Like I have lots and lots of time for some Q and A and discussion. Yes. You talked about prioritizing vulnerabilities. Would you take, when you mentioned CVSS, would you take exploitability into account? Like yes, that's uh, part of the CVSS scoring. So, I'm not, I'm not familiar, so oh, can you elaborate? Yes. So um, CVSS is a, just give it to Google. Yeah, and I, it's, I know ratings, but I don't know what they're based on. So. Oh, it's based on a lot of things. So um, wh whether it's on the same, like on the same network, if it's public facing or if it's internal, that's a factor. Um, whether or not it's exploitable is a factor. Um, the, I, think, I think they take likelihood into account as well. Um, and... That's all I remember at this point in time. I know there's more. Um, I'm going to blame jet lag, but <laughs> um, but yeah, it does. It takes that into account. So uh, I think you raised your hand first. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. That would, of course, make a difference. Uh, like, sure. Like the data, like how, um, like the sensitivity of the data. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's another factor. Yes. Good job. Um, <laughs> but yes, if you have something that's only available to 20 users, that might be a lower priority for sure. Um, I would ask questions like, what is restricting people from getting to it? Like, it's, if it's... If it's on a network where anybody can access it, but only 20 people can log in, it might still be an issue. Uh, I don't think it's broken down quite to that level of detail, like how many users use it. Um, but internal versus external, basically, it's kind of a binary. Yeah. But the, the point is, whatever you choose to use, it should be objective. So that's one example. Um, you, can, you can come up with your own system and make a spreadsheet to score it or some fancy code, um, you know. So whatever you use, it should, just, it should be objective so that personal opinions about how important it is don't really come into play. So just eliminates arguments. Yeah. Yes? Well, the maximum is 10, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an external program. Um, uh, uh, we haven't invited anyone external there to avoid conflicts. Of interest right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, sure. I, I wouldn't. And sorry, for everybody in the room. So the question was, he has an external bug bounty. And I should have repeated all the questions. I'm sorry, I am out of practice. But <laughs> so he has an external bug bounty and questioning about inviting internal people to the external bug bounty, which is a great question. And I will add that to my slides for the future because that, that's a great question. Um, but my recommendation would be to not do that. You want to keep them separate. Um, just because of what you say about the conflicts of interest. So in an external bug bounty, you're giving them money. Um, and internal, I would advise against giving them money. Just like maybe a bonus at the end of the year for somebody who finds a lot. Um, but it's really just more to make it fun and to get people to do your work for you, which... Um, is always good, but it's it's 
it, it's also building goodwill for the security team as well because if people are seeing you as fun and uh yay they're the people that give us donuts or whatever then you know that that comes in handy later down later down the line so does that answer your question or, or are you trying to find a way to still invite them to the external bug bounty? Right. Yep. On the. I would like to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think my official answer would be to ask your legal department. Can, can yeah, I delete that? Yes. <laughs> so, what happened with a customer of mine is that they, they had an external bug bounty program, which was very successful as in they found a lot of bugs and they the company leadership just took that as like yeah this is awesome and our bug bounty program is fantastic and we paid out millions of dollars in bug bounties and look at that and the developers of the company were they're like what the fuck are you doing you're paying external people millions of dollars for finding bugs and, and they felt very neglected because of that and, and it, it sent like the entirely wrong message and, and developers were actually not very pleased with, with how that was handled and how how much praise was given to, to the people finding those bugs. So maybe maybe a lesson from that is if, if a company can divert the financial resources from the external program to internal people, I wouldn't give it to the individuals who find the bug, but to teams like, hey, we fixed this many vulnerabilities and that saved us a bunch of money from the external program. So mm -hmm. we can distribute that internally if, if that's an option. I don't know. But um, it's it's that it's a very sensitive topic for developers because you're paying people to find their mistakes and then praising other people to find them. I mean, it, it can go wrong really quickly as well. That's a good point. Did everybody hear that? Or, okay. It's so quiet. Um. Just a uh, reply to that. Uh, mm -hmm. We looked at the, the bug bounty program to see security measures which were more than our normal or other uh, security uh, efforts have to wait. We have the, the bug bounty that they do. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. it. I, I think at that company they they were like doing them in parallel, but eventually like the boat with the security net got up front a bit and, and started catching more before they could have done it internally. And yeah, that that resulted in some good things. Cool. Yeah. I like this having a discussion. It makes me feel less uncomfortable up here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Join you on stage if you want. If you want, yeah, we can get you a mic and <laughs> we can do a whole panel. We have time. We <laughs> Cool. Um, yes. They have not asked me to, but I would love to. Um, this was at my uh, previous corporate job. Yeah, um, and just lessons learned from there. Yeah. That's a great question. So yes, I will. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so the question was, uh, do you have any metrics about how many more vulnerabilities you found because of the internal bug bounty? And then that's a fantastic question because I myself did not track that and I should have. So I would, I would advise tracking it because it shows the success of the program. Um, but just kind of a guess, um, definitely found a lot. Um, a lot is very vague term, uh, but still really kind of a small fraction of the amount of stuff we still ha had from the tools. Um, the, like the tools are going to find stuff, but the really creative vulnerabilities that they that the developers found uh, were always just like, wow, this is great. And oh, that's another advantage of this that is not even on my slides, but you want the people familiar with the code looking at it finding vulnerabilities because I can come in as an AppSec person and re read somebody else's code and I will find lots of vulnerabilities but the really weird ones are something that you have to know the code intimately to really be able to find so encouraging them to do that and giving them fabulous prizes like donuts um, is it's a great way to do that but it's I didn't track like how many but um, Definitely, it's, it was just like the really creative, like I would have never even thought to look for this kind of vulnerabilities, so. I have another one. 
Yes. Oh, we can come back. Okay. You'll think of it. If you think of it later, I'll be at the party tonight. Okay. <laughs> so, I did. Okay. You raised your hand first in the gray. I saw you first. But, oh, but I like your shirt. So. <laughs> Well, obviously you want that to happen too. So that's a great question. Um, this is, so the internal bug bounty is about finding bugs, but then you can also have a totally separate contest for who fixes the most bugs. And I would do both. Um, and- I was just envisioning a, a, a typical thing that we are running like software for security analysis and we said quite a lot of outdated uh, mm -hmm. Right, yes, well, you want all of that in the same place um, was kind of my the idea. So, so you're able to prioritize, just do a sort by vulnerability severity. Um, and so I, I view that as kind of a prerequisite to creating the bug bounty is to have all of your vulnerability data in the same place. And then once you do that, it makes your life a lot easier. Um, yeah, but did that answer your question? I'm, I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Um, the first one would be to find the bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one would be to someone else to hold them and put them into the system. So my job will be getting the bugs rather than just finding them. Oh, well, um, it, it's all about how much work you want to do. So, um, it, I, yeah, I would encourage you to, you know, offload some of your work because I'm sure you have too much. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it doesn't matter. It does, like, however you want to do it. But... My goal is to make your, your job and therefore your life easier. <laughs> By the way, in my context, I don't typically have like a security exception for security. Mm -hmm. I typically take like security. So typically things would have like a default security that you could open to. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would try to outsource, and that's what I find successful in the build bug bounty program, outsource the security testing and scrutinizing and so on internally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering like, if this generation of tickets can get hard working, get fixed, and some other can be successful. If you're running an internal bug bounty program, what, how would you approach a ticket that is also password remote from another system? Depends on how severe it is and how to approach it. So, how to approach something that hasn't been fixed in three months? Um, it's a great question, and it, it sort of depends on who's in charge of fixing it. So my general political advice for you uh, is start at the bottom and work your way up. So if there's an engineer assigned to the ticket, you'd want to talk to them about it. If it's not assigned, then I would talk to whoever is in charge of assigning said ticket. And then if that doesn't get any, like, and give people a chance to get back to you. You know, you don't want to go over their head for no reason, uh, but then escalate further up um, the whatever the corporate ladder is, you know. Um, so, and one of the best ways I have found to convince people like, hey, we should really fix this is to exploit it in front of them. So that's... Take away their donuts. Hmm? <laughs> Take, away their donuts. Take away their donuts for sure. No donuts for you. Um, <laughs> Disclosing. So, okay, uh, context. We are uh, in a large company with several developers in the tools and security teams. 
Uh, that depends on how you do it, I suppose. And what, what I'm not sure what industry you're working in, but if it's something that needs to be really top secret, like government work, then maybe not. But I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, so at, at the last company where I did this, I had not the details of vulnerabilities, but I had kind of a list, like a score scorecard. I called it a scorecard of like who had the most highs, mediums, lows. And everybody could see it. It was it was on an internal web page, and not the details, but just the numbers of like this is this is highs, mediums, lows. And then you can do the same thing with the with the bug bounty of like this is Dustin found the most vulnerabilities. He found forty three this month. It's amazing. Um, so you want it to be public so everybody sees it. Um, but the details of which I don't see any harm in disclosing that across the company um like sometimes a little name and shame will will get you some some action like get you some act sorry that's not what i meant um <laughs> i i heard it come out of my mouth and i was like no um get so, something will happen that's what i meant <laughs> um but I totally forgot what i was saying i just flustered myself and <laughs> just um but yeah, so but use that sparingly because I find that shame doesn't really motivate people as much as a pat on the back, like that the second quote that I had up there. So and and you don't want to build that reputation of like, oh no, I can't tell them something because they're gonna tell everybody about it. So I I feel like if you can detach it from the person responsible, like oh hey there here's this really terrible vulnerability we found, uh, but like not name who did it. That's totally fine. Um, does that help? Does that answer your question? Okay. I keep, oh, it's my lock screen. Why? I am seeing my slides. I don't know what happened. Just, okay. <laughs> we're, we're good. So, um, did you think of your question? Yeah, I was thinking, uh, just finding bugs or searching for bugs. Mm -hmm. That's a great question that I would ask your lawyers, but um, I see nothing wrong with maybe like just taking a, an afternoon, like a four hour chunk of time and just saying, hey, today we're going to go find bugs. Um, but it depends. If you're trying to get something out, like there's two days to launch, then maybe not. But um, it de just it depends. I, I think it's totally fine to do that on company time because it's for the company. Yeah. Yes, sorry. This is a great discussion. Thank you. <laughs> the del which one are the delivery teams? Oh, well, this would be internal, right? Yeah. So, um, they, do you have a Q, QA team that tests things? Or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Ah. I gotcha. Um, well, I would lean heavily on your executives for that and make it not optional if you can. Um, but it's it's one of those things where I personally, I believe that secure code just works better. And it's, it's one of those really hard things to explain to somebody who's not into AppSec. But if, secure code is good code. Good code is not always secure code. And if you work on the security of your code, it's going to be better. It's going to be more stable. You'll have less emergencies at 3 in the morning to fix. 
those those sound like good reasons, but um, I could see how that wouldn't be obvious to a developer, but does that help? Okay. Is there some, did you have a question? Yep. Yes. Um, oh, that's a great idea. Thank you. I should have given you a heads up that I had so much Q&A time because I talk really fast. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, do you have any data on or experience with uh, how pricey the, these gifts or prices should be? I mean, is a donut enough to <laughs> <laughs> enough for people to actually uh, go on and yeah? Um, I don't have any data, but my my instinct is that donuts are any sort of motivator or appreciation will be appreciated. And I used appreciated twice in a sentence, but I think I know what I mean. Um, <laughs> it's just, even if it's just something little, it doesn't have to be a great big, huge prize. Even if it's just something little, and this comes down to how you present it too, but just appreciating people for their hard work goes a long way. Um, just, just, my, just my experience, we don't have data to back that up. But if I get real bored, I'll study it. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. Yes. I see a couple people. Okay. <laughs> uh, Wait for the mic. Wait for the Because I should really repeat questions. <laughs> but. I'm sorry. It's not a, a question. It's a, it's a, a comment. Uh, I hope that's, that's okay. That's fine. Uh, I, I think a lot of these uh, questions or this discussion is about uh, security culture rather than the bug bounty program itself. Mm -hmm. um, if your company doesn't truly feel that security is important, then you're going to fail. You're not going to get teams to do prioritized work over uh, other things. So building that security culture is extremely important and also very difficult. Um, but, but, but you truly need buy-in, uh, you know, from the, the uh, uh, as a core of the of, of the culture that you know a SQL injection is something we fix now not tomorrow but now maybe we should take the solution offline yeah I totally it's agree. A, important enough so, so so getting that uh sorted is is a prerequisite to to succeed in a bug bounty program or any mm -hmm. other program i think yep. But also extremely difficult, and I don't have answers on how to. <laughs> I have do that. I have a few tips, yeah. um, but I think I, I don't know how many people would would want to hear my experience of that. But um, it, so okay, thank you. This this is great. I love having the discussion because it has filled up a lot of the time that I should have used. But anyway, um, <laughs> so at my last corporate job, um, I was starting from complete scratch. So they had about 15 different products and no AppSec person and hired me and said, here you go. Um, so that was a total greenfield. Nobody had really talked to them about anything yet before. Um, and so just starting from scratch on building a security culture was uh, painful. Um, <laughs> but I, I had mixed results depending on kind of who you were talking with. So keep in mind there were 15 product groups and then they kept buying more companies too, so more people to bring into the fold. And um, I, I guess I did, I'm trying to think of like what, what I did. I don't have slides for this, but um, it started very slowly of just like working on let's fix the pen test re like reports like here's a new pen test with the exact same findings as last year let's f let's fix that so it started with like things like that of just getting buy-in with that um and then eventually i got to the, to the point where i got to do training across the whole engineering company or engineering team across the company sorry I only had one cup of coffee and I'm jet lagged. So, <laughs> um, but I think the training was the thing that probably shifted the culture the most because it, it reached everybody. And 
everybody suddenly understood why it's important. It wasn't just like, oh, Jillian's coming here to bug us again. It was, oh, it, that was when it shifted into, oh, hey, I found this cool bug. I think it's a security issue. Can you come check it out? Um, so it takes time and patience and stubbornness. I like to call it persistence, but I'm really very stubborn. So um, it just realize it's not going to happen overnight. Culture shifts take a long time, but they're worth it. So thank you for your comment. I think somebody else had a question. Yes. Okay. And then we, we got about 10 minutes left, but if you're getting tired of questions, we can go get coffee. <laughs> so for an external program, mm -hmm. uh, you don't generally award um, bugs that are, have been previously reported or maybe also previously known. For an internal program, mm -hmm. um, what's your recommendation? Because, well, if you have a centralized uh, list of vulnerabilities, somebody could go there and look, or they could actually go there and check. So it could be cheating, or they could kind of find out that it's already been reported. Yes, I would do the same thing of not, or not paying out necessarily um, the the repeats. So if it's already got a ticket, which is something that hopefully anybody could just look up. So if it already has a ticket, then no donut for you, <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, yeah. But I think that sometimes in the mature system there will be so little to find it will be quite advanced. So if like for the starters, mm -hmm. it would be hard for them to to find something at all, and that's kind of disappointing sitting there for three hours and not finding anything. Well, I mean, it does sometimes take a while to find bugs, but I wouldn't expect them to just... I Honestly, it's the sort of thing that if you're writing code, you, you should like probably just go on doing your job and looking at the code, you might eventually find a bug, in which case you report it and you get a prize. Um, but you can also just do testing, um, just like a four hour window of some, like all the engineers get together and hack their own code. Um, that can be kind of fun, but um, I'm not quite sure if that answered your question, but <laughs> it's, yeah, it can take a while and that's okay. But anything else? No? Who else runs the bug bounty program? Right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, awesome. Well, I'm going to last call for questions. No? Okay. Well, I, thank you so much and for being a part of the talk with asking me questions. That was, that was great. Um, so if you think of anything later, uh, I'll be at the party. I'll be around. So thanks for coming. <laughs>